Bull Hodge, 1907. All right, good morning, and thank you. I'm going to talk about persistent post concussion syndrome, PTSD, and hyperbaric oxygen, and essentially review all the studies that have so far appeared in the literature. The Army Hops study has been presented in various situations, but it's not, a, it's not out yet. Not published, so. Okay, well, the first thing I want to do is just go through a very short review of brain anatomy, uh, traumatic brain injury, so we all have a good idea of what we're talking about when you look at the data in these studies. The brain, composed of neurons and glial cells, used to be thought that the neurons were the only component of the brain that had anything to do with thinking. It's now appreciated that uh, the glia do more than nourish and support the cells. If we look at all the neurons, you can think of them as small trees. They have branches, receive information from other neurons that touch them. Electrically, the charges are sunk through the trunk of the tree or cell body and passes out through a single axon that then branches like a root system to touch. By the time we're adults, maybe 100 to 1,000 other cells. Great diversity. And they come, of course, in all shapes and sizes. And they're arranged in three-dimensional orientation that's the most complex thing in the world. And when you look at these photomicrograms, they're just so beautiful, but it's easy to see the complexity of the brain. The glial cells, as it turns out, always thought to just nourish and, uh, nourish and support, uh, in fact, modulate the neurons. They can influence blood flow, they have electrical activity, they communicate with the neurons, uh, they have stem cell capability, they're nine times as plentiful the figure previously used for neurons was uh, about 10 billion that were born with, and now the figure is estimated to be about 100 billion, so we have 900 billion glial cells in support. And interestingly, I, I saw this quote here in an article that thought to be responsible for processing creativity, imagination, and our thinking mind. And here's just a picture of them, the schematics, the different colored glia as they're attaching to the neurons and influencing them. You see them here, uh, neurons in red, the astrocytes, uh, glial cells are in green. Okay, well, neurons and glial cells are distributed in two rough, uh, different types of tissue, roughly different types of tissue. Uh, we have gray matter and white matter. The gray matter is the dense concentration that's around the outside of the brain. So we essentially have a cap of denser tissue around the outside. And then we have a deep gray matter, basal ganglia, thalamus, connecting to the midbrain and brainstem, which is another deep con uh, concentration. Uh, and then connecting all of that is the very flimsy white matter, which can be thought of as the cable in the brain. Very fragile, 60-some percent fat. I like to think of it as kind of organized mayonnaise. <laughs> And then all of these little neurons and little trees are arranged in forests throughout the brain that give us function. And Dr. Slade and Dr. Breiner both showed slides showing all of the different functional areas in the brain. As it turns out, though, this isn't so cut and dry. Uh, in fact, given the connectivity, if you think of 100 billion brain cells making 100 to 1,000 connections each, uh, everything is connected to everything. And, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they did a, fu a functional MRI study, real-time blood flow, with uh, some students at Berkeley. And they were mapping the location of visual images. They showed them, I believe it was 900 images. And what they found was the visual cortex, which is that little area back here, if you were to estimate, given all of the folds, the gyri and the sulci of the entire brain, what percentage of the brain's cortex do you think the visual cortex is looking at this map? It's pretty small. In fact, what they found was visual imagery was stored in 20% of the brain. So we have the function, while we've tried to identify these major uh, functional neuroanatomical areas, in fact, things are distributed pretty widely. And here are the white matter tracks. Prior to, and this has been uh, much of the problem with traumatic brain injury. Mild traumatic brain injury, primary injury, is in the white matter. 
and with increasing force, you injure more of the white matter, and eventually you injure the gray matter as well. Well, all these years there's been no way to image it. CT scanning doesn't pick it up. Typical MRI does not until late, usually, and you might get some T2 hyperintensities a millimeter in size, but for the most part, it's been invisible. In fact, it's all over spec. It's a very abnormal pattern that you can see. But finally, now, with diffusion tensor imaging tractography that tracks the white matter, uh, the computer will give a different color to each different directional orientation of the white matter. So as water moves in the direction along the white matter tracks, the signal can be picked up by the computer uh, after the radio frequency pulses. And you can see all the different directions for the very broad tracks of white matter throughout the brain. Um, you can see that it's just incredibly, incredibly detailed and complicated. Okay, so TBI, as we know, is a done degenerative non congenital insult to the brain from an external mechanical force, possibly leading to permanent or temporary impairment of a variety of different functions that are associated with diminished or altered state of consciousness. You've seen all these figures, you're pretty familiar with them. Actually, I just saw the Department of Defense had put out something in a uh, publication, and there now this figure is estimated up to three and a half million. You know, mild TBI has been called the silent epidemic for many, many years, because if you think about it, so many of the sports concussions, so many of the, the falls, the injuries that we have at home or in our daily, daily life, people don't go to the emergency room to, and, or don't go for evaluation, so they don't show up on any type of hospital survey, ledger, ICD-9 codes for emergency department visits. So there's this huge iceberg of, uh, of mild traumatic brain injury out there, and the more that people are aware of it, uh, the numbers keep going up. All right, so what happens in traumatic brain injury? If we just take the classic flexion extension, or I should say deceleration injury, a fall, um, um, or a blow to the head of any type, uh, we have a brain and a head in motion, and suddenly it stops moving, at least the skull does. But the brain is mobile. It's floating in a bag of liquid, and so what happens? It impacts the inside of the skull. And then, of course, ratchets back and forth. If you now add torque to this, or twisting motion, you get a ratcheting of the brain between the faults and all the cartilaginous structures in the brain as well. And there's a primary injury and a secondary injury. The primary one is the direct contact. So going from the outside in, you know, scalp, soft tissue contusion, even a skull fracture. And uh, what has been ignored for many, many years until an article finally was published last year in Veterans is what happens to the dura. I mean, if you injure the outside, you can injure the skull, and you injure the brain underneath. And the dura is between the two. We ought to injure the dura. Well, if you know, one of the primary symptoms with traumatic brain injury is headache. So where does headache come from? The brain has no sense to it, kind of. Uh, but it is not a sensate organ. So, you know, cutting, burning, twisting, doing whatever to the brain tissue does not have a sensory component that we can then sense injury to the brain. The dura has all of the sensation. And that's the protective cover for us. So, if you're injuring the cover, you know, it's the, something's wrong, it's an alert, etc. Uh, and, uh, and that's the protective uh, uh, mechanism for the brain. But what they did was they did MRI, and typically if you do an MRI for trauma, what do you do? You usually do a non-contrast study. You're not looking for vascularity, tumor vascularity, for instance. What they did was MRI with and without contrast in these veterans, and they found that 54% of them, the dura lit up. And of course, headache is a prominent symptom, and there it was. We had our explanation. So, in all these years, uh, when you don't have the imaging, you don't have the science to explain something, what do we do? We call it a psychiatric disorder. Now, with the imaging, we're finding all of the biology that's underneath. So, we have the direct contusion, and then you've got the acceleration, deceleration component. And what does that do to all the organized mayonnaise? If you've got a very dense cap connected by a flimsy structure to a deeper one, when you flex the brain, you break the white matter connections. And that's what happens in TBI. So if we look at this little color diagram from the top of the brain, what is this? This is where you separate 
the vessels from the skull, from the dura, and get epidural and subdural bleeds. Here are the direct contusion areas where the inferior frontal lobes, orbital frontal lobes, and anterior temporal lobes impact the middle and inferior fossa in the brain, the bone, and of course the back as well, since it's we're getting a flexion extension move. And this, on the sagittal view, is very, very underappreciated, but this is all of the white matter injury that's going to be distributed throughout. If we had a transverse section, you would see all of that. I'll show it on, on some of the stuff here in a minute. So what happens to the organized mayonnaise in a, in a mild traumatic brain injury is you don't necessarily have to divide the axon. What you damage is the cytoskeleton, the transport system of it, and that eventually can separate the axon, or I should say decay. So what we're generating here is a little wound in the brain. And if you look at that on photolytic photographs, that's exactly what you see. These are all the damaged axons that have been divided. And when they do, the transport system can still keep flowing stuff down there. You get these retraction balls at the end where the fluid builds up. So what we've got are microscopic wounds. Now, the brain is a, a solid liquid substance. What happens when you put an expansile object right in the middle of tissue? If you look at the, the micrographs of the capillaries and how they invest the brain, the capillaries surround each neuron almost like a, uh, a little bush. And if you expand the size of the neuron or any structure, what you do is you compress those small blood vessels. So what we're doing is we generate ischemia and a wound around here, which is going to have what? An ischemic penumbra. If we have a large enough area of damaged tissue, we're going to have what we saw on one of the slides that uh, the doctors were showing yesterday. Dr. Steve Locke and others who have a central core that will die. And then a surrounding area that can, can still be alive. So we've got this distributed throughout the brain on a microscopic level. Is that big enough to be seen on an MRI? Yeah. But indirectly, with the compression of this in white matter, you knock out cable and you're not going to have the electrical transmission. And how does that show up? It's indirectly with decreased blood flow in the cortex on functional MRI, SPECT, PET, etc. So here are these on, this is a statistical parametric, a statistical parametric mapping map, which uh, Dr. Hipskin and Dr. Goosler uh, are going to show. And if you take a look, where is the damage in this mild traumatic brain injury? It's all throughout the white matter. All of the organized mayonnaise, which has been damaged in that flexion injury. And it doesn't show up on MRI. Here is a diffusion tractography, and this was shown uh, yesterday also in a slide. These are the sagittal views, and you can see it's the corpus callosum now coming up on one side. And remember what I was saying, the computer will give it a different color with each different direction uh, of the white matter. So what we have is for one side, you'll see this brownish and the green here. But look what's happening. This is intact in full length. Look at all of these truncated white matter tracks. Uh, Dr. Hendricks, by the way, has treated a case where they were able to do this before and after treatment and showing hyperbaric oxygen restoring some of these tracks. Well, if we look at these cables and see what's happened and how we're damaging it throughout uh, a bundle uh, of cable. And uh, just an aside, what's the other area that's primarily injured, primarily injured in traumatic brain injury? Is the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a short term memory organ for the brain. What is one of the primary symptoms? Uh, post-concussion syndrome is loss of short-term memory. And the reason is it sits to medial structure to the temporal lobe and it's sitting right against the bony base of the skull. And that coupled with its vasculature and the way it's tethered, it's one of the first things that's damaged. So that's the primary injury. Once you form that wound though and there's any tissue damage, what happens? We have a secondary injury. It's the inflammatory reaction. Anytime there's any tissue damage, you will trigger all of the inflammatory cascade, which results in edema formation, a little retraction balls, compression of tissue. Uh, actually, the contraction balls form edema around them. Reduced blood flow, reduced oxygen, excitatory amino acid elaboration, free radical damage, lipid peroxidation and cell death, and damage. And just a quick aside on blast injury. Blast injury has four components to it. Primary blast wave and secondary flying debris can cause injury. Tertiary injury caused by acceleration of the body getting, and the blast wind getting thrown into something. 
uh, and the quaternary one, flash burns, chemical smoke inhalation, and so on. Uh, but if we look at the direct blast force and the blast wave that follows, what happens is the primary injury is to the lungs. And uh, Tom Fox was the one who was first uh, brought this up and was thinking about it. If you look, and, and Steve Reimers now has done a, a bit of research on it, there's a paper that we hope is going to get published sometime, but it was shown at uh, a couple of meetings, HBOT 2012, uh, and it was, I believe, also at UH, UHMS meeting. And, if you look at the mortality from blast, where is it? It's all from lung injury. So the greater the blast, the greater lung damage eventually is a disruption of the lungs, and people die from that, massive air embolism, uh, hypoxia, and so on. But for the lower level injuries, and I say lower level, uh, the degree of injury that doesn't kill, in fact, the blast force is above the level, uh, the threshold for microscopic injury to the lungs. So in fact, what may be happening, and this is why blast injury, at least in my experience, and now from stuff that's getting published, seems to be a more complicated and serious injury than just a simple traumatic brain injury. Why? We're releasing bubbles into the circulation. So we've got a combination of decompression sickness as well as the traumatic brain injury. If we look at the veterans that I treated in, this, in uh, our study, and I go back to uh, treatment of chronic decompression sickness, where the two symptoms uh, locations where we have a lot of trouble getting recovery function, inner ear and joint. So people with chronic decompression sickness involving the inner ear and joint, uh, I tell them up front, there's very low likelihood that I'm going to be able to improve those symptoms. And that, those two were the most resistant symptoms in our veterans with blast injury. So, indirect information. Well, in addition, to, so we've got a negative pressure wave that can also generate bubbles. I'll show that in a second. There's a kinetic energy transfer, energy transfer from the large blood vessels, so the blast, sending a blast wave up through our vessels into the brain. Uh, there, are, there is mechanical irritation of J receptors uh, in the lungs that cause apnea. I don't know if you've talked to uh, some of these veterans, but if you talk to enough of them, uh, they will give you a report that they were laying there dead and their buddy started to do CPR on them. And what is happening is, and induced apnea, secondary to the injury. In addition, there are chemoreceptors that lead to a bradycardia and vasodilatation, contributing further to hypoxemia. And so the conclusion is, blast brain injury is a, an atypical, complicated form of traumatic brain injury. Well, here's the blast wave, and this is different for thermobaric explosives and high explosives, the blue. But the point is, after the blast wave and increase in pressure, there's this negative wave that follows. And given that this is occurring over 50 to 100 milliseconds, 150 milliseconds, you think of the pressurization, it might be possible, we haven't done the theoretical calculations on this, but you may be able to de novo pull gas out of solution and form bubbles just from that negative pressure wave. Here are the models of this, looking at a helmeted one and pressure uh, in the brain. If we look at the blast wave, here it is. Here's our model, with a, a human model, with uh, uh, the brain here. And our pressure um, legend for 2.25 bar, which is 2.25 atmospheres roughly. And you see what happens. The blast wave is not necessarily completely evenly distributed. There are peaks in, in place. And when it hits the, the skull, you see what happens. It's unevenly distributed in the brain uh, between the helmet and the model. You can see the high pressure here. It's lower up front. It's even lower back here. But then in the brain, right underneath, we've got the maximum pressure here, and then differential distributed around. So we get an uneven distribution of pressure. Well, it turns out that once initiated, traumatic brain injury really is no different from any other injury. You know, it, uh, contusion to the muscle, uh, even a broken bone. Uh, from start to finish, it's stereotypic because it involves an inflammatory reaction. So I've used this analogy. It's like taking a DVD for every little teeny wound in the body, and you plug the DVD in, and it plays from start to finish. And what is the evolution of acute wounding is chronic wounding, scar formation, et cetera. And of course, in this case, the scars don't necessarily heal. We have unhealed wounds. No different, really, from a diabetic wound. But the result is, as I was talking about a little bit earlier there, with the ischemic penumbra, we have microscopic wounds that are distributed throughout the gray and white matter, primarily the white matter, and they're consisting of living, we believe, functional brain tissue, not yet dead, as well as some dead tissue. 
So here's a little model I showed yesterday. It's the, the Marx model of the radiation injury. Really, there's no difference when you think of expansion of uh, edema, especially in closed space. We're getting these. Okay, well, just a very quick <coughs> definition of PTSD, because we're going to talk about this in these studies. It is formally classified as an anxiety disorder, precipitated by an experience of intense fear or horror while exposed to a traumatic, especially life threatening event. And it's characterized by four things intrusive, recurring thoughts or images, avoidance, hyper arousal, and diminished emotional responsiveness. And it's got to be present for at least a month. But it turns out once you have it, most people don't get rid of it. It's, uh, it's a long-standing condition. Now, some of the conditions, that are some of the treatments now are shown that we can lessen this and uh, able to have a oxygen, maybe, maybe cure this. Um, but another comment I wanted to make about this, and you've seen it, it's all over the news, it's in every DOD uh, epistle, um, that nobody can tell the difference between TBI and PTSD. And why is that? Well, if you look at Dr. Heidi Terrio, who was Fort Carson, the Army psychologist, her point is, well, yes, you can. And you do it by what's called structured interview. Well, it's no different than what you do as any healthcare provider, but a physician sitting down and talking to a patient. You start with the event and you go forward. If you have an injury and you're symptomatic from the time of that injury, well, it's pretty much an injury to whatever organ system is giving you those symptoms. And in the case of the brain, it's a traumatic brain injury. PTSD is not, or the symptoms of PTSD, all of this, are in fact not intrusive thoughts, avoidance, hyperarousal, uh, emotional uh, responsiveness. None of this is part of uh, an acute traumatic brain injury. Post-concussion syndrome, yes. So if you sit down and you can identify the actual traumatic event and walk them through this and find out that they're symptomatic from either the time of the event or very shortly after you can make the diagnosis. Well, the problem is that the, the symptom complex with all of the other symptoms that are attributed to PTSD, where did this come about? Came about after the Vietnam War. And what happened in the Vietnam War? What were the primary munitions that were used by the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese? Booby traps, mines, rocket-propelled grenades. Almost identical to what we've done in Iraq and Afghanistan. And how many of the injured that came back with PTSD also had brain injury, but nobody appreciated it. Nobody even questioned them about it. And so what we've got is a definition at a time of uh, uh, PTSD that likely included the symptoms of traumatic brain injury, or I should say the subsequent post-concussion syndrome considered that uh, included the symptoms of traumatic brain injury that nobody has ever tried to separate. Okay, what's hyperbaric oxygen? We talked about this. I'm going to keep pounding this home. Treatment for wounds in any location, in any duration. And of course, what we're doing is, is gene therapy. Uh, so let's go through all of these studies. And uh, I just want to give you a little bit of the history of how this Dr. Duncan gave some of it, but we made countless presentations in Washington uh, starting in February of 2001 at the NIH. Uh, we then went to Walter Reed in January of 2004. Uh, we offered um, to treat veterans for free. If they would test them before, image them before, send them down to New Orleans, I would treat them, send them back, they could repeat the testing. And as it turns out, we, we met with the PMR group there. And while I was there, I, my roommate from medical school, I had heard, was it Walter Reed? It turns out he was the medical director. So next thing you know, we were in his office, and I made the offer. And long story short, we couldn't get it done. So I put out a little thing that I would treat veterans for free and ended up in USA Today. Um, and uh, we meanwhile made multiple legislative uh, approaches and proposals. We had one to put chambers in Iraq for the forward edge of battle plan. Steve Reimers was going to equip uh, um, some Connex boxes with multi-place chambers. Uh, we couldn't get it funded. Um, and then finally, um, Dr. Duncan, Mr. Hoffman, and I, uh, who recently deceased, it was mostly that me on the phone song, uh, visited 300 congressional members, and we got the appropriation um, that we're now currently using to fund the study that we're doing in Louisiana. Well, meanwhile, what had happened, uh, Dr. Eddie Zan had a good friend, has a good friend, uh, 
or, or excuse me, uh, judge and general, Pat Mayne, lives in Fort Walton Beach. And Mr. Hoffman is the ex-secretary of the Army under Gerald Ford. And his legacy was that he kept seeing the PTSD and Agent Orange complaints that were coming out of Vietnam, and he tried to get uh, Army medical to address these research and so on. And uh, they slow rolled him until he was out, changed of administration, Carter came in, and that was it. And so uh, what happened though, since then, he stayed very active with the Department of Defense, the State Department, and after we went into Afghanistan, he was asked to help recruit the rebuilding team that would go in and rebuild political infrastructure for Afghanistan. So he tapped his good buddy, General Maney, 37 year uh, Army Reservist Brigadier General, Florida State Judge. General Maney went over there 12 months into his tour. He was blown up in their armored SUV, unconscious. Spent 10 days there with dysfunctional. They flew him home to Walter Reed and essentially wandered around Walter Reed for a full year. Uh, unable to be returned to not only active duty but his home, uh, you know, cognitively impaired, now testing in the quote normal range, being told you are normal, or you're complaining about now, this is a state judge with an IQ that's average. I don't think so. Uh, and uh, while he was there, he got a little bit of cognitive therapy as well. He got all the other therapies, and he had some improvement. Um, not significant. And uh, Dr. Zanthi and his wife. Uh, the protocol that uh, we've been using for years, and we went on to George Washington, got treated, and he's back on the bench. Mr. Hoffman saw that, and he was on fire. Uh, he visited him, of course, before he went to Afghanistan, while he was at Walter Reed, and now after he got hyperbaric oxygen. And Mr. Hoffman wanted this for every injured veteran, so we had a new ally, until unfortunately he died uh, last month. Um, and uh, so what happened was uh, all those visits occurred with uh, Bill Duncan on the Hill to try to get uh, our appropriation and additional monies. Well, this is uh, General Maney's case, and essentially the IED, the explosion, et cetera, the improvement, got 80 treatments, returned, returned to part-time work as a judge. He's very active now in the Veterans Court. Uh, well, my little comment about Tree for Free got picked up by USA Today, and I got a phone call from a Boston judge whose son was the uh, Army machine gunner. Uh, uh, honorably discharged, but very impaired, uh, very symptomatic, and um, what ended up happening, uh, we brought him down to New Orleans and treated him, and first time for better treatment, unremitting headache for three years, were gone. Uh, by the 8th, sleeping all night for the first time in three years. By the 12th, uh, energy up, tolerating crowds, uh, just the timing of the French Quarter Festival every April in New Orleans. 400,000 people on the streets, and he was able to go down and tolerate crowds where he'd been previously very reclusive. <coughs> and then, by the 25th, I prepared treatment, he came in, he said, my PTSD is gone. I, I'm not having nightmares, I'm not waking up on the floor uh, uh, every morning after my nightmares, so I'm out of bed. Uh, and by the 39th, he was markedly improved. I published a case in Biomed Central's Cases Journal. He went on to get additional treatments, and uh, he just sent me in May, he graduated with a master's degree. Um, and he's just doing great. Here was this imaging, and you know, we reverse them sometimes to confuse uh, instead of before on the left and after on the right. And I, if you just look at the gestalt, and this was apparent on the imaging that I believe Dr. Uh, Reiner put up yesterday, the one spec scan. It's heterogeneity. So if we injure all the white matter tracks, downstream transmission is going to be affected. And since the white matter projects to so many different areas, you're going to get a heterogeneous pattern in brain blood flow, which is very abnormal. And if you look at that, so you can have areas also that overcompensate. So we have high flow, low flow, high flow, low flow. And if you look at that, you see the spread of, you know, we've got high flow, low flow, high flow, low flow, and this distributed irregularity, which now is a general smoother appearance. You can see it on really every one of these rows. Uh, if we look at it up close, again, you can see that uh, there's more variability in the pattern on this right side than there is on the left. This is the more normal pattern of brain blood flow, where it's in a normal range at rest, which translates to very little color variation on a uh, multicolor format. Well, here was this 3D. What were the classic areas that uh, I showed you on the little uh, 
picture there before with blue, purple, and pink. The contusion areas are orbital frontal lobes right above the eyes and anterior temporal lobes. Look where the damage is here. And after that month of treatment, uh, not cured, but much better, and consistent with the 3D that would, or the uh, transfer slices. So, what happened? I then treated a string of these cases, and Bill Duncan ended up uh, at a, some kind of social event in Washington where Admiral Walsh, I believe it was, was at it, and Bill was standing there talking about hyperbaric oxygen. And actually, Admiral Walsh started by saying, Wow, we got a terrible problem with our sailors and Marines with uh, traumatic brain injury and PTSD. And Bill said, Well, we got a treatment for you. And um, the next thing you know, uh, because of all of the noise that Bill and Mr. Hoffman had made on Capitol Hill and uh, really they put the military on the spot, uh, resulted in this presentation with the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery of the Navy for me to present this information. So on August 14, 2008, uh, I went there and the sole purpose of it was to ask for funding to do the study that we wanted to do. Uh, and they had a esteemed group of people that they assembled um, it turns out three of the six, and, and part of the, the, the uh, group of people that was driving this were the wives of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, moms are a powerful force. Um, in the audience were three of the six cases that I had treated, request for funding, and I was told at the end of it, Dr. Hodge, funding is the least of your problems. We have $900 million. I said, wow, that's comforting. So we're funded. Well, no, we weren't. Uh, it was retracted and we didn't get any money. So we had to raise money. Um, but unbeknownst to us, uh, a group of doctors had sent a letter uh, right before my meeting announcing that they were gold standard for four decades in hyperbaric medicine and they wanted to assist with the establishment of a steering committee to guide them through this process on the best way forward. Well, maybe as Gene asked them, would you please help us put this thing together? So I reviewed the upcoming Air Force TBI study and I said, look, here's a problem. We've got two doses of hyperbaric therapy that have never, ever been applied to chronic mild traumatic brain injury persistent post-concussion syndrome. Now, we're doing rat research. There's no big deal here. You can do rat research all day long. Who cares? But the results of this with the imprimatur of Air Force Department of Defense over it, it's going to be very hard to overcome if you misfire it. And we know that children, that this has bioactivity in chronic brain injury with CP. We don't know what either of these doses will do in chronic brain injury, but we know we didn't get improvement in the years that we were treating, <coughs> excuse me, all of our diabetic foot wound patients who had previous strokes, traumatic brain injuries, and so on, over decades of time. It wasn't until we lowered the dose and came down that we started seeing gratuitous improvement. And so I told him, you, you really should do this, should not do this on top of it. <coughs> Excuse me, I produced a study that was done out in China that showed in moderate to severe TBI in the subacute period where they did a two atmosphere study, they had an 11% seizure rate. Grand mal seizure, oxygen toxicity, 90 minutes, etc. And this was ignored. Uh, and a consensus conference was convened in Alexandria, December 5th and 6th, 2008. And uh, a white paper before the conference was submitted that said that hyperbaric oxygen at this dose was safe because there was all sorts of discussion. What you're doing is I'm safe. You're putting our, our sailors, our Marines at risk, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, well, geez. Actually, I, I didn't put it on here, but I, I started my lecture with a uh, uh, four-month-old baby who had in the chamber down in New Orleans. And I said, you know, I, I can put this baby in this chamber and you can send uh, the U.S. servicemen to Iraq and Afghanistan to get blown up. What's the greater risk here? Um, so anyway, so we had 60 experts there. And uh, we had the working, they divided us into various working groups. And we were put in the protocols group, uh, Dr. Duncan, myself, and a few others. And it was the fight of our life to try to argue about the control group. And we kept trying to say, look, there's bioactivity here. You're going to put an unknown in. And we've got 700,000 injured that are depending on the results of this study, we can't misfire. Well, we were overruled. Uh, we were then asked to lead all of these DOD studies, and four days later, uh, Bill Duncan got an email, and we were told to go our way due to undue bias. And I'm sorry, 
outside influence. So uh, it was after we were invited back to a meeting, January 2009. So what we ended up doing was we went out and we raised uh, the small group of us, uh, Dr. Duncan, Mr. Hoffman, and myself, uh, $653,000. And that's how this study was done. We the LSU pilot trial. And we had a gap in the midst of it with funding, and it just so happened that we were right at the halfway point. And so that became the data set that got reported and finally published in the Journal of Neurotrauma. Well, we got all the data now, and uh, it should be published late this year or next year, and it's very impressive. Uh, what we also did now is I went back and I matched all 29 of our veterans to normals that I uh, spec trained in the late 90s, 98 to 2002, under LSU IFB approved protocol. And what we were able to show is that the veterans' brains before hyperbaric treatment are statistically significantly abnormal compared to our normal group, and after one in 40 treatments, they are statistically indistinguishable. So, I guess we would have had to have amazing placebo to completely normalize brain blood flow. So anyways, the protocol is what it is, but we compressed this, and this was part of the problem. There's an urgency, I want to get this thing done. We've done this a lot of people over the years, uh, twice a day, but there are side effects with it. And especially with PTSD, we found there were some side effects. Um, if their uh, percent back to normal rating was less than 90% uh, after the 40 treatments, they could do more. It turns out they had no money. So everybody only got 40 treatments, and I'll try to roll through this kind of quickly. We started in September of 08. We had one dropout. He had an ear infection, then bullous meningitis, and barrel trauma. He had to stop. He had a hard uh, a return date for a uh, plane flight. And so he couldn't complete it, and, and we just, uh, he had to drop out. But uh, I reported the 15 at the um, International Brain Injury Association meeting of March 12th, 2010. Three days later, Dr. Duncan, Dr. Mosigani, Mr. Hoffman, and the group and had a meeting with the Army Surgeon General where we were promptly told that all this was placebo. And what we found was this significant improvement. We did a six month phone follow up, maintenance of gains. Uh, Dr. Duncan put the one quote up there for you uh, in one of the blistering critiques and letters to the editor. Uh, we responded by our statistician actually was a little pissed off because they were trying to claim the statistical analysis wasn't quite right. And this was a Georgetown University uh, academic uh, statistician, John Pizzullo. And um, John did the numbers and said, when you have 15 of 21 outcome instruments or 16 of 21, all showing a statistically significant change, even without a control group, the chance of a chance occurrence of that is one in a quadrillion. So here was our average time of treatment. Uh, it was 2.8 years out. Uh, and not good. That's, what we found was, in terms of safety, five had middle ear barrel trauma. What happens? You're doing this twice a day. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is mildly immunosuppressive. What would happen is we found a number of them would develop an upper respiratory infection. And they're in the chamber and in the prodrome. You're swelling up mucosa. They don't know until they can't clear their ears. Uh, and so we had to take some breaks, give them some time off. The one drop down. Four had transient deterioration in symptoms about halfway through, emotional ability, headaches, depression. Two had a worsening of anxiety. One had to meet in the emergency room over. Uh, a guy with PTSD had gone off his medicines nine months before. And uh, I really think it was due to the rapidity and intensiveness of the protocol. It was okay. Uh, you go slower, it's, uh, it's a little easier, you can adapt, and, and so on. Um, but here it is, the symptom of you know, we had improvement in, across the board, pretty substantial. 64% of those on psychoactive medications decreased their medication use. Six months, those who were improved right after the treatment are set on their primary symptom thing, unimproved, maintained it. One of the guys who said, I got them from that. Was called up and asked if he'd come back and get more. Uh, and I said, yeah, I, I did it better. Uh, and here were the statistics for full-scale IQ, delayed memory, all the neuropsych testing, and the p-values, some things we didn't get significance with, but that's for the first 15. If we look at the symptom questionnaires, the river mean, which is part of the DOD studies, uh, the PCLM, which is the PTSD, the post-traumatic checklist military, uh, what I wanted to do, we designed this to use some of their instruments. So if we hit significance, it couldn't be claimed, well, you didn't do what we did. You didn't measure the same thing. 
uh, depression, a significant reduction, almost 50% anxiety, similar perceived quality of life, market improvement, they felt better. Um, and the imaging changed as well. And if we look at the heterogeneity, what this is showing, these are the amount of cats uh, in uh, their bins, you call them. So let's say we take a pixel, and uh, 5 to 10 counts, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, et cetera. And what it's showing is that we have a range of blood flow. Most the average is right here, or I should say that's the median. But it's kind of a bell-shaped curve. That's not normal. It gives you this irregularity. After a hyperbaric treatment, you see what happens. This narrows, and it becomes a little more confined, which is a more normal distribution. Well, we also did statistical parametric mapping, and here was after one, after 40 treatments, significant areas of improved blood flow are in red. P value of 0 0.001 was our threshold, which is a conservative one, the rest of the brain. We also then looked at the hippocampus. We had statistically significant improvement in memory function. What's the short term memory organ of the brain? The hippocampus. So we had the computer dissect down the hippocampus, and you see after one treatment, we partially light up the right hippocampus, a little bit uh, on the left. Um, and uh, see it here, but look what happens after 40 treatments. We have marked improvement in blood flow, consistent with the improvement in memory. And here are just the additional pictures of the hippocampus. Okay, so what happened was, <coughs> we then did, did the statistics on 24, I didn't put the 29 up here because we're in the process of submitting it, but this has moved over further. Our IQ one is a p-value of of uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 7. Um, the granted, we don't have a control group, but everything was directionally in the same direction. And, I mean, if we now run the statistics on the one in quite really, it's going to be one in Avogadro's number or something like that for a chance thing. But you can see what's happened is the p values have strengthened, if you will, on most of these. There are things we didn't get as significant, and here they are just comparing them and what had happened. So it was pretty reproducible. So essentially, in one month, I prepared significant improvement in symptoms, 15-point increase in IQ. But actually, now that we've done all 30, it's a little more, closer to 14 points. Uh, significant increase in cognition. 8 to 14, no longer met the criteria for PTSD. I haven't seen this in any PTSD study that, that's had a similar conversion rate, if you will. 51% um, reduction in depression, 38 in anxiety. And the percent back to normal rate that veterans saying, how do you feel now? How much improvement did you have? They estimated it was pretty good. So what happened, uh, I started, we got our appropriation, and uh, that was in uh, September of 2008. You have to take delivery of the money by, because in the next fiscal year, or final fiscal year, well, we started calling to try to find out where our money was, because it never got sent to us. We kind of were told, well, we can't find your appropriation. We don't know where it is. It's kind of someplace. And we finally tracked it down, and we had to get uh, Louisiana senators and congressmen to get on the phone to get this deposited two days before the thing expired uh, in 2009. So we finally got the money, and then uh, it started, well, wait a minute. I, I know this is going to be heavily scrutinized. Uh, I've got a die every I cross every T. Um, the Army had gone to the FDA and got an investigation of new drug exemption. Now, for the entire history of hyperbaric medicine, as I talked about yesterday, uh, hyperbaric medicine has been under the devices section, Center for Devices and Radiologic Health. And so it was like, well, you know, I don't understand why they're going to the drug side. So we started with that request I described yesterday of, do we even need one? is a significant risk. And the long story short, we finally got approval by the FDA, the Army, and they'll shoot everything uh, May uh, 8th of this year. <laughs> to see when we started. But uh, what happened in the process was, um, you know, we asked them, uh, uh, you know, would you accept our protocol so that when we're done with this study, and it's a randomized controlled design, we will be able to apply to you to get a new medication for hyperbaric oxygen. And they said, no, because of this whole pressure thing, we want pressure controls. But there's no way to do that adequately. It's never, there's never been a pressure control in hyperbaric medicine where you actually tested the people to find out if they got fooled on which group. 
So what ended up happening, Marty Hoffman then went to DARPA to get a $2 million grant, which he did, and that's the one that got appropriated to Dr. Sifu. We attempted to combine these, and we were all in agreement, and suddenly the next day, I was told that it would be an impossibility. I needed to go my own way. Uh, so we then started Ember, uh, got the FDA answer and what we had to do. Uh, the pre-IND request went through that, your combination, your, your intervention, a combination of therapy. And uh, so I did the literature search. We found out all of this stuff and how I explained it. It underscored what we were trying to say at the consensus conference about the error in doing these quote, sham air pressurizations, they're not shams. They are all treatments. Um, so um, in the process, out comes the Wolf study. It finished up, and this was uh, the Air Force study, 2.4 ATA versus 1.3 atmospheres of air, single center, double blind, sham control, not. 50 military members transported to San Antonio where they spent the time there doing the study. They had to have at least one combat-related mild traumatic brain injury. And there was the protocol, 90 minutes for 30 treatments. Anybody ever seen this anywhere? Never. So we're testing. The whole consensus conference, by the way, was called to either validate the cases that we were showing at an atmosphere and a half or not. That was the entire reason for that. And out of, out of that, this had already been underway, as it turns out. They applied for it, but uh, the study didn't start until well into the way, I think, 09 was when they <coughs> first patients in, but if you look at this, here we are with a protocol that had never been done before. They used the impact, which is a computerized test, and the PCLM, uh, military's PTSD checklist, and a bunch of other uh, outcome instruments, and they did measure it weekly and then six weeks. Uh, but to this date, they have only reported the symptom portion of the impact. We can discuss that later, but results were no significant difference in the post-treatment means on the impact of PCLM between groups, and this is key. What they did was measure the average score, again, for each group, and they compared the two groups. That's fair. You assume one's a control group. That's the way studies are done. But they also looked at within-group improvement. So you take each person and you compare their score at the baseline to their score afterwards. You get a value. You do that for everybody in the group, and you take the average value, and you see, did they improve? Did they not? Did they get worse? So we have within group and between group uh, comparisons. That's the way you do a study when you're time, trying to test a treatment, a drug, whatever. Keep that in mind. Conclusion. Well, what they found were statistically significant improvements in both groups. Conclusion was HBOT at 2.4 ATA pressure had no effect on post-concussive symptoms. I'm sorry, it did. Your data showed that. It didn't compare to your control group, which was another therapy. What this was, though, was a dual dosing study. So let's look at the graphs. And this is the PCLM and our two control groups, control and hyperbaric oxygen. You see that both of them improved over time. And actually, by the end of it, they're starting to lose the effect. What is that? I mean, was it too much? Uh, I don't know. But you're starting to lose the effect there. It's, and at six weeks, uh, you even seem to lose a little bit more. One did not change, but you know you come up a little bit. Still, though, pre to post, both groups have significant improvement. It's almost a 10% improvement by the numbers. And here's the impact, though. So the, the um, cognitive symptoms. And if you look what happened with the control group, they had an immediate worsening uh, by the end of the first week but then a steady improvement that even improved six weeks after. What happened to the 2.4 ATA? We get an improvement, and then we lose the effect. What is this type of effect? And then a rebound to improvement after you stop. This is the toxicity response in hyperbaric medicine, the hyperbaric oxygen. It's what I put in, it's in the whole chapter in the 2001 symposium book from the New Valley Conference, where Dr. Neubauer uh, asked me to give a talk on the dose of hyperbaric oxygen. And I said, well, you're probably not going to like this. I know you, you know, recommended 200 treatments to my first diver, but in, in fact, you know, I'm finding that we're getting into trouble with some of this. Uh, as we hit about 110 treatments or so, and people using the 90-minute protocol, actually 90 minutes, we're 
I'm getting it back to about 65 treatments. So it's 60 minutes, it was up in this range. And so I showed 33 cases there, and this was the same type of pattern. Um, and he wasn't happy about it, but I mean, it was the data, is what it was. So I wrote a letter to the editor pointing out what they had done, and then I quoted all of this uh, literature that I showed you yesterday from the uh, review by McDonald and Frazier. Please get that and read it. Uh, but all of these biologic effects with micro pressure, uh, to this day, there is no published response. I don't know if, it, if you realize if somebody attacks, I should say attack, I kind of did, but I mean, if you write a letter to the le editor against a journal article challenging the results and essentially are claiming that the results are totally invalid. Uh, I mean, the first thing happens, what if the editor goes to the authors of the study, and then they send it to others to peer review it, and you respond. And you got the bully pulpit. You got the last response. You don't get, the guy who writes the letter doesn't get to come back and object. So you get the final word. There has been no final word. There is none. It's just been left like this. It's a hanging chat. <laughs> <laughs> what essentially was was a multi-dosing study with two effective doses of hyperbaric oxygen on TB1 and PTSD, plain and simple. Okay, now there's there's got to be some placebo in it, I'm sure. But what also happened was that. I know George Wolf. He's a decent man. And I, I immediately sent him an email on him. I said, George, look, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to write a letter to this. And he said, yeah, I know. He goes, uh, but it's OK. Um, he said, but I, I'm not the corresponding author. I can't even respond to you. And I originally called him up to alert them to the fact that if you went online the day that study was uploaded, there was no data. It was just text. None of the data got online. I said, wow, you guys published a study, you got these negative conclusions, there's no data, don't even look at it. And he said, I wasn't in charge of that, I didn't upload it. So they took the thing down and got corrected so on, but he has not spoken about his own study. He is not a corresponding author, which is, is odd. Okay, let's go to the next one. So this is now the DARPA study that Marty Hoffman got funding for. This was to be a combined one with what we're doing now. It got done in, what, single center, Everybody got transported to Pensacola Beach. And I will argue, of all the places now the DOD studies have been done, where do you think might have the greatest placebo effect? Pensacola. Sun, sand, beach, babes, I mean, come on. <laughs> all of these Indian male veterans, where would you want to go on TV? <laughs> and you're going to see, it. these are the most muted of all the results. Uh, so 60 service members, uh, members in three groups. I'm studying, it, this has already been reviewed in Unseen Hyperbaric Medicine with sample analysis. And what's been claimed is that all of these studies that are being done by the DOD are underpowered, potentially, to even get positive results. One answer, let's say that. Uh, well, a positive result. Um, but they had to have one related, uh, combat related TBI. So three groups, two atmospheres of pressure. So we compress on air. Rising PO2 and the pressure, and then two atmospheres you put on a hood and given a hypoxic mixture that gives you normoxia at depth. Where's this been done in TBI? Nowhere. Nowhere. Again, 700,000 injured people at least, just in the military, depending on data, not a rat study. The other group got the dose, quote, typically used by uh, hyperbaric. Practitioners or aficionados or something like that. I've never read practitioners, I think. And then the other got two atmospheres of pure oxygen. 60 minutes, once a day, 40 treatments over 10 weeks, river bead, post concussion, symptom questionnaire, and PCLM immediately uh, before, post treatment, and then multiple other outcome measures. A whole bunch of them. But this study just reported this. And results the between group testing showed no significant differences on individual or total scores on the PCLM or the river mean. So again, assuming our control group is that two atmosphere pressurization with normoxia at depth, calling it a, a kind of room air equivalent with a control for pressure, uh, they don't see any difference between the groups. OK, well, that's between group testing. If you look at the within group testing, there are significant differences on several individual items for each group. And the two atmosphere oxygen group had a statistically significant improvement in PTSD. 
Conclusion, though, cyclobrac oxygenated one and a half or two atmospheres equivalent had no effect on PCS symptoms after MTBI compared with sham. Okay, well, how about the PTSD? This is a study on, uh, you did two outcome instruments, two primary outcomes. You treated PTSD and you treated post-concussion syndrome, and you should report the data, but as you look at it, it's not in the title, it's not in the abstract conclusions, and it's not in the conclusions of the main article. You gotta dig this out. The study essentially showed there is effectiveness for two atmospheres of pure oxygen, 60 minutes once a day, 40 treatments on PTSD, and it compares favorably to other PTSD therapies. It kind of is consistent, it's very consistent with what we did in an atmosphere and a half. It's consistent with the Wolf article as well, but the results are not in there, or at least it's not, you have to dig it out. Well, that study has now been reported in three segments, so the next part in publication is in neural rehabilitation and neural repair. Um, and by the way, I, I wrote a letter to the editor to, to point this thing out, and it was rejected, and uh, he said, we'll deal with this in an uh, editorial issue uh, sometime in the future. I haven't seen it. Um, uh, so now, uh, additional data is presented, and this is going to be the harder outcomes, computerized posturography, group, pegboard, multiple neuropsychological tests. And uh, um, what they did was, no immediate, the results were no immediate post-intervention beneficial effect of 1.5 or 2 ATA oxygen compared with the sham air intervention. Okay, again, assumption that that was a sham treatment. Conclusion, do not support the use of hyperbaric oxygen to treat cognitive, balanced, or functional, uh, excuse me, deficits associated with uh, mild TBI and persistent post-concussion syndrome. Well, let's look at the data. Uh, it turns out there were 110 outcome measurements, and they talk about outcome. The, the language in this article is very interesting, but there were 55 different tests done. 55 before, 55 after treatment. Okay? And what they did was they took and they calculated an ANOVA for each individual test, comparing the three different groups before. And then they went and separately took the same group for the same three groups for the same test afterwards and compared those scores to each other. Turns out 106 of the 110 ANOVA p values are insignificant. So, anybody looking at this article, any doctor, how do you, you know, you go and pull an article on PubMed, what do most doctors do? You don't have time to sit and dig it and go through all the complexity of an article. Most people, how many people are expert in this stuff? I mean, they read it, find out, can I help my patient. Pull up PubMed, there's the abstract, look at the title, look at the introduction. Conclusion, didn't work, done. Hey, it's a, a study with a negative result. And when you look at 106 of 110 p-values that are negative, what's the conclusion you, you draw from that? It turns out though, as I was talking earlier, you measure each person before, you measure them after. You get that <coughs> value, you average it for each group, then you compare between groups, you do within group, between group. There is no within group or between group comparison in the entire study. Go look at it. You will not find it. In fact, there are no treatment effects reported at all uh, because the statistics don't allow you to do that. And if you look at this, so here let's just take group pay for it. Sham air, two atmospheres, one and a half. Here are the number of, of veterans that were in each group. Uh, here are their mean scores. You can see there's a little difference here, 66, 72. Standard deviation is fairly high. But when we compare these three numbers with those standard deviations, there's no significant difference between them. Okay, cut. Now we go to post-compression. We retest them. We don't measure 66.3, there's a, uh, 67.5 minus 66.3 and get a number, or 68 minus 66, or 70 minus 72. No, we take those three and we compare them again, standard deviations, and we have another insignificant p-value. And you can run through the 106 of those. So, uh, what was the treatment effect? You can't tell. There's not, it's not published. But, 
if you're going to take what I did, wrote a letter to the editor, summarily rejected, and I pointed out to them, well, let's just take your four significant ANOVA values before, and let's really calculate uh, and, and see after the p-values are insignificant. So they go, well, oh, geez, this were abnormal before, but now they're normal, so the treatments have no effect. Well, part of what it's saying is you had a differential. First of all, this is saying, is there variance between these groups? And it says yes, meaning the score on this test for these three was a little bit different. Doesn't tell you who's different, who was low, who was high, etc. Uh, well, it did, excuse me, it, it told us on the other one, but the point is, it is significantly different. Afterwards, though, they're now not significantly different. But if we look at the difference from pre to post for each group, you can see we got a 0.6 change here, 0.4. Whoa, we got a 2.6 change. This one improved by 31% in the oh, 1.5 ATA group, and the others had lesser improvement. Well, if you did this for the uh, California Verbal Learning Text Index Recognition, and we do the same thing. Look at this, a 17% change here, a minus 140%. They did worse at that dose, and a whopping 78% improvement there. Go down to the California Verbal Learning Test, short delay Q recall, same thing, 5.7, 2.4, And you can do this, now, I didn't do this for all you know, 55 tests, but I was trying to make the point to them and show that here is the treatment effect, and what we're seeing is that we've got some differences. If we go down to this one, and this is what I'm going to show you with a kind of analogy here, and we look at the differences, all three groups improved almost 20-some percent. It's a big change. But, but if you look at all three of them compared to each other afterward or separately before, key values are insignificant. So I, you know, in my letter with the editor, I said, well, this is real simple. Let, you know, for an analogy, let's do a diet study. And we're going to do three diets. And we're going to look at the effect of diet on weight loss. So we're going to measure the effect of each diet on three groups of people equivalent to three doses of hyperbaric therapy on veterans with TBI and PTSD. So you weigh each patient before the diet, and you subtract that from each patient's weight after the diet. Then you sum, for everybody in the group, the average weight loss or gain, whatever, for each patient, each of the three groups, and you compare them between the groups to find out how each therapy did. So essentially to measure treatment effects, you measure with any group differences for each subject, Take the average for each group and compare the differences between groups. We get between group comparison. The difference between each group gives the efficacy of each diet on weight loss. Okay, so let's do the sham diet, the subway diet. We're going to do the bologna diet, and we'll do the deep fried New Orleans diet. <laughs> and we all start at 300 pounds, okay? Actually, in New Orleans, we're number one in the country. We should be 350. <laughs> but, uh, and what we're going to do is compare. We're going to do exactly what they did in the study. So let's take an ANOVA, and we want to see, are these three groups different? Well, ANOVA would say, there's a pound difference there. There's two pounds here. No. So we've got a non-significant ANOVA. Now let's look at what happened after each of these diets. Well, these guys lost 60. These lost 58 pounds. And these lost 62 pounds. And so we now compare these three values to each other, and guess what? You know, it says they're not significant. Well, wait a minute. We each lost about 60 pounds. It's almost 20% of body weight by any standard. It's a good diet. Even the deep fried Mormons diet. They were all good diets, right? But within group significance, uh, uh, well, there's significance there, and between groups, though, it is insignificant. This is exactly what was done in the reporting of the statistics and the data in this study. So, uh, you know, really, what's the conclusion of my diet study now? Dieting had no effect on weight loss compared to sham diet, the subway diet, right? And that's exactly what the conclusion was in this study. So, Really, the true conclusion is given the methodology, the data reporting, and the analysis. It's impossible to draw conclusions from the study. You can't tell if hyperbaric oxygen any dose had any effect on cognitive balance or fine motor deficit in subjects with mild traumatic brain injury, PPCS, unless you go and take and measure each one of those. Well, we tried to do it 
and I took it to our statisticians at LSU and asked them to run a statistic on You can't do it because the standard deviation of the difference is not reported in the study. All right, so let's look at the third publication on this study. This is now in the Annals of Neurology. And the outcomes here are going to be the symptom questionnaires plus everything, functional cognitive psychomotor outcomes at three months. And uh, I want you to read this. All the doctors here in the, in the because your doctor is supposed to know statistics, right? Uh, the interaction of time by intervention group was not significant for improvement, nor was there evidence of efficacy for any subgroup. No significant time by inter uh, intervention interaction was found for any functional, uh, cognitive, or psychomotor secondary outcome measure at an unadjusted 0.05 significance. What the hell did that say? <laughs> um, those are the results. And it, well, did it work or didn't it work? What's that? The guy was really smart because we couldn't understand him. That's exactly right. This is really brilliant the way this is done. So using a randomized controlled trial design and analysis, including a sham, results show no evidence of efficacy by three months post-compression to treat all this stuff. Well, let's take a closer look. If we look at this, what they did was what's called an F-test on, on all the data, which is the variance between treatments, in other words, between groups, or the variance within treatment, within groups. So it's a between group over a within group. Uh, okay, it, it's an ANOVA type of thing. It's kind of a complicated thing. What it basically looked at, what, did any of these things have any effect on the outcome of the study, the changes that occurred over time? And essentially, none of them did. Loss of consciousness, you know, post-traumatic amnesia was really one of the only ones there. Actually, PTSD did, excuse me. Uh, the McGill questionnaire that uh, they did. Um, and if we look at hypothesis test for the treatment by time interaction for the secondary outcomes. Okay, well, what are these? All right, so we, you know, we look at, did it work or didn't it work? And essentially we've got a lot of insignificant p-values, so I, I, I guess this, this didn't work. But the one graph that they put in there, if you look at this, and this will explain the F-test, what they did was, at each time point before, after one week, and then at the end of the study, they compared the three groups and they ran the ANOVA on it. So they're saying the values here weren't statistically different from each other, nor were they here, nor were they here. But if you look at this, this guy started here, this group, and they ended up there. We got a difference here. That group didn't change at all. And this group, excuse me, went from here to here, to here, we have change. But what's the pre post? You can't tell. So here is the hypothesis test for subgroup efficacy analysis. Again, a whole lot of negative or insignificant p values. And here is the results that, although not relevant to assessing intervention efficacy, because we declared that sham treatment a sham, when in fact it's another dose. But although not relevant, some secondary outcome analyses did show significant effects with one or more explanatory variables similar to the primary outcome. Following measures were all statistically significant, irrespective of treatment. Well, you can't even tell which treatment produced it. But what they showed was, on all of these cognitive tests, they had significance. Where do you find the data for that? It's not in the paper. It's a separate download. You gotta go here in the supplementary data, data tables to get it. And so if we look at the supplementary data tables for working memory, whoa, significant. And what it means was memory, if you hear it, balance, uh, baseline measurements were lower than the two week and 12 week measurements. Well, what's that mean on memory? Your memory was worse before you started and it was better after two weeks than 12 weeks. Okay, uh, why don't we say that? Memory was improved. Oh, I'm sorry. Ooh. Get excited. Okay, so there's working memory. Well, we can do this for the others. Here's executive function. <coughs> Same thing. Significance. Here is California, uh, California verbal learning test. Significant change. The set. 
controlled uh, self attention executive function, uh, significant value. Uh, event visual memory test, significant. Coward letter fluency, verbal fluency test, significant. So, what are the results of the Annals of Neurology secret paper? Did hyperbaric therapy have any effect or not? By the data, no treatment effects were ever measured. And the conclusions were predicated on this 288 year sham group. The true conclusion here, you, you can't, even with those figures, it doesn't tell you which of the three groups changed. It just tells you that overall at the end, there was a significant change from the baseline. In other words, that can be used to describe this, but I don't want to do it publicly here. <laughs> they're, not, they're not swear words, but you know, they're, I mean, what happened here? Uh, you put this in the hands of, of some of the top people with the best reputations, you get DOD over the top of it, and, and we report stuff like this where you can't even figure out what's going on. And the, the true conclusion here is that it is a multi-dosing study of three doses of hyperbaric therapy, which had never been done before, in which the statistical analysis renders it impossible to tell if there was any treatment effect of any dose of hyperbaric therapy. Neither within nor between group comparisons were reported. And last, you know, the Israeli study, and uh, I'm not going to elaborate on it, I think we have to talk about it, but they essentially took the protocol of use for a number of years, and they did the mind streams, computer testing, quality of life, spec brain imaging, they got the same results, we've been getting them all along, and other people have too. Significant improvements in cognition, no significant improvement in the control group, it was a randomized, controlled, and crossover. Spec had an elevated brain activity with the cognitive improvements, and uh, I mean, what's the conclusion? The obvious HVT can induce neuroplasticity, leading to repair chronically injured brain functions and improve QOL and MTBI patients with persistent post concussion symptoms at the late chronic stage. And finally, we have Ember. We're getting the same results. We submitted it, uh, we discussed, reviewed, and we're working with trying to uh, see if we can get it published still. But essentially, symptom improvement after 35 treatments. 8 of 8 NM mood, 6 of 7 NM neurocognitive, and 7 of 10 CNS vital signs cognitive measures were significantly improved. Uh, increasing numbers correlated with improved outcomes. The more you did, the better you got. Up to, you know, we look at 80. And the conclusion was hyperbaric oxygen in an atmosphere and a half for 35 to 80 treatments, significant improvement in symptoms and cognition. So, what are our conclusions here? All the existing data that's come out, that if we first start with just the TBI, mild and moderate TBI is primarily a white matter injury. That's why we've never been able to see it. And in fact, if you look at the statistics we did on that statistic and uh, the uh, uh, um, texture analysis, where did we hit the home run? It's in the white matter. And you can't even read that on the spec. You see it derivatively in the gray matter downstream. Mild and moderate TBI results in primarily white matter wounds. We have treatment for wounds. There's no, way, no two ways to argue that. Uh, there's accumulating evidence that both in veterans and civilians, which all of us have been doing for many years, the Israelis now have done this study in civilians with MTBI showing the benefit of multiple doses of hyperbaric therapy immediately after treatment. Don't have long-term follow-up. I've got a six-month phone follow-up and we're doing a six-month cognitive follow-up with testing right now in this study. DOD studies are showing benefit, but it's complicated by confusion over the sham groups and inadequate statistical analyses. Ideal dosing, we don't know, but we got enough to treat now. And lastly, you know, we talk about all this data. These are all real people. And this is part of what gets lost in all the, you know, clinical trials. This isn't rat research, and this is why we were so adamant about trying to do these studies right the first time around, because as you can see now, all the negative press that's been put out, you know, trying to fight the DOD's name on studies that have been properly done. Oh, the DOD did that to prove it was, you know, you might prepare people, you're just, you know, uh, fantasizing. Um, but these are real casualties. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hodge. We do have seven minutes for some quick questions before our panel discussion. So, the first hand. I'm sure it's about to go up. Bill. I'll just make a quick comment. Uh, 
when the reporters came to see me in Oklahoma City, they said, quote, we looked this up on the internet, how come VA and DOD were the only ones that couldn't get this to work? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, when we first started doing this and talking about it, the very first things that were published uh, in newspaper interviews with the Department of Defense were the quotes that uh, this was going to bankrupt things that the average cost to treat the veteran was $500,000. Um, and that's the real reason, I think, behind all of this. They're afraid of short term what it might cost, especially when you look at a $2,000 an hour hospital billing charge, you know, uh, 80 treatments, uh, $160,000 right off the bat. Um, so I, you know, unfortunately, it's a, it's a very short-sighted approach, but uh, in the military, you can do things very, very inexpensively. So it was a convenient um, objection, but really didn't have any evidence to it. Thank you. We have our next question. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned functional MRI. Mm -hmm. How accessible and compared to that spec scan? It's not that accessible. Uh, and it's equally expensive, but uh, it is not that accessible. And functional MRI also, there are a number of different ways that are done. You know, some of them will do task-specific one, looking at visual uh, function, motor function, uh, and cognitive function. And it depends on the test they're doing and, and so on. Uh, um, we don't have access to it, uh, and we've used SPEC for so many years. Uh, we've done the normal stuff. You know, introducing yet another imaging technology here, we don't have a base to rely on. And it's kind of like starting over, but uh, I encourage anybody to use it because you'll be seeing the same thing. That we're measuring the same thing with SPEC, with functional MRI, with uh, um, QEEG, and what Adam Reiner, you know, the way the brain works it is consciousness directs activity, electrical activity, and metabolism. I should say, metabolism fires up. Electrical activity results blood flow simultaneously. And what he's measuring is electrical activity summed over these areas, a little bit larger size areas, but it's all the same. Thank you. We have a few quick questions. <clears throat> Paul, thank you for your persistence. Um, in the article that you published, the letters that came back um, talked about the learning curve on a lot of these psychometric tests. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I have no expertise in that area. Uh, can you address that issue? Isn't that true of any repetitive testing modality? And is there something that you could potentially use that's harder, that you can't relearn? Uh, first of all, we addressed it in the actual article. And uh, they just overlooked it. We talked about it because one of our outcomes was working memory. And I quoted the figures in the study with placebo experiments showing the amount that you get with placebo effect. And our uh, the delta, our treatment effect, was far greater. So there are some of those that are very, uh, or pretty much independent of practice effects, learning effects, and so on. Um, and we addressed that in our response to the letter to the editor. Um, so you try to uh, pick ones that have alternating forms. And we, we had some of them in there, but we've got more in the current study that we're doing. What we looked at, though, was all the placebo data. Where have our tests shown a placebo effect and uh, to what magnitude? And we try to compare them. In this future article, we're going to use what are called reliable change scores, where it looks at uh, testing that has been normed, and they have looked at significant change independent of placebo effect, and we still have it, even without our control group. So, yeah, that's a, a big question. With the AMM, in fact, the learning curve is about three, four, five repetitions of it to get to a plateau so you don't have a learning effect. Thank you. We have our last question. You may have addressed the issue of uh, medication, uh, having trained as a psychiatrist. I know that many of the psychotropic medications can have lingering effects. So were these folks off medications or any of the one medications? And did you look at that impact? We did. It was variable. We had some who quit the day before they started the hyperbaric oxygen. Well, unbeknownst to me. Uh, you know, we had told them we didn't want anything changed. They showed up, they said, I want off these medicines. You know, maybe this will help me. 
They stopped. We did the study and didn't go back on them. The figure about 64% was 64% of those on psychoactive medicine while we treated them stopped using them or decreased their dosage. And so <clears throat> some of them, yes, I know they have effects on cognition. And that's part of what we measured, I'm sure. They weren't as doped, uh, you know, when they repeated their testing, but the, the key was why they stopped their medicines. What started happening was they felt better, or they started feeling side effects that the medications uh, previously were treating some pathology that was now corrected, doing better. Uh, Ritalin, for instance, is the classic one that we give with children. Uh, once you treat the underlying pathology and they start improving the attention deficit, when they take the, the Ritalin, they get the speed effects that an uninjured person would get. And so they stop using it. And so we factored all of that in, we explained, we said, look, we know there's got to be placebo effects in here, but look at the magnitude of the size. And we know that all the other therapies out there have placebo effects associated with them. Nobody wants to talk about them, but we, we put them in the study for comparison. We say, if you just compare and do a you know, therapy to therapy, you, you still can't discount this. I was actually thinking of the negative effects. In other words, those folks that didn't get the full effect of the hyperbarics, maybe go back and look and see if any of those were on the atypical antipsychotics. Boy, I got that data right in the computer. We could. I, I haven't done that. Okay. Can we once again put his little lecture show?